The next section is about arrest algorithms. It's really some important concepts here. So I'm just going to draw some parallels to another scenario in emergency, which is trauma. Traumatic cardiac arrest guidelines have been accepted and have, uh, uh, have some evidence to say that they actually imp improve outcomes now published in the literature. They're widely accepted. We hope that we get a traumatic arrest well before the asystolic. We hope we get them when they're pulseless or sometime before that so that we can do um, a, a specific set of uh, interventions that are much more effective than CPR and adrenaline. We don't want to do CPR. It's going to interfere with decompressing the chest giving the blood volume, decompressing the pericardium, putting the tube in. I work at a trauma hospital that uh, it, it happens simultaneously, all of those things. I, in Australia, we use this thing called the four H's and four T's to think about reversible causes of, of, of cardiac arrest. It's, it's not that helpful because hypoxia, that one of the H's is for hypoxia, but it doesn't tell you what to do about hypoxia and asthma. It just says, oh, they're probably arrested from a hypoxia. It's not descriptive or prescriptive. So we need to move on and evolve our resuscitation algori algorithms to be more sophisticated than they are. We've done that with trauma and we've done it really well, but there's other conditions that would be suited to its own algorithm. Most jurisdictions have resuscitation in special circumstances, but we need to expand that. Just going to make some parallels between VF versus hypoxic arrest. In VF, uh, the blood is not, not deoxygenated. You know, you've suddenly, your heart suddenly stopped, but your sats were 100 when that happened if we're talking about the classical scenario. Um, I know there's lots of versions, but you know, the lungs still work. And we can probably, the, the brain's gonna start dying in four minutes, but we can extend that time with effective CPR and some, maybe a couple of breaths every minute and doing some, uh, and the priority is about chest decompressions and defibrillation, as it should be. It's an extraordinarily good algorithm, but only if you've got VF. In hypoxic cardiac arrests, the blood is already de completely deoxygenated. That's why the heart bradyed out, out and stopped. So we've got deoxygenated blood and the lungs don't work or the airway doesn't work. And so if we do CPR and adrenaline, all we're doing is circulating deoxygenated blood. And we can't extend the time for uh, brain survival unless we fix the lungs or we fix the airway. The approach is ABC. So we've, I don't know what's happening elsewhere in the world, but in Victoria, uh, we've de-emphasized, and I suspect this is elsewhere as well, uh, is that we've de-emphasized early intubation in adult ar arrest practice. And uh, it, that's partly because of the success of the VF algorithm, it's, it's great. Um, and it's partly because that's what we learn when we go into our ALS training is that, oh, it's 30 to two, uh, 30 compressions, two breaths and a bag valve mask. And that feels comfortable to us, but um, it, sometimes that feels easier than actually trying to do what might be right for the patient. It's clouded by some pre-hospital studies where trauma and cardiac arrest data have variable findings. So uh, we, haven't, we haven't quite got the emphasis right. So, and that especially applies to asthma and anaphylaxis, where it really needs to be an ABC approach, and we're going to go through that now. Uh, so why is there a need for a specific asthma and anaphylaxis algorithm? Well, um, asthma and anaphylaxis are no different to trauma in needing a set of specific interventions which are more effective than CPR and adrenaline. There is no respiratory arrest algorithm out there. So when these guys have a respiratory arrest, we need to intervene with some specific interventions, but lots of protocols just say, go to the, C the ALS algorithm, which is not what they need, they need the ABC. But respiratory arrest occurs universally uh, in asthma and anaphylaxis as they arrest and, and become bradycardic and asystolic. And the teaching of this topic currently lies with decentralized teaching, particularly here in Vic Victoria. It depends on who your teachers are, who your, uh, you know, what the culture is of your emergency department, what sort of case mix you see, um, because it's not centralised. Um, and so, it, you know, I, I know what to do. I teach my trainees what to do for, for, for the last 10 years as a, as a director of training in ED, but um, that's not the same teaching that necessarily gets delivered down the road. It doesn't cater for people under stress. 
uh, there's nothing there to support them in this situation and it doesn't cater for the lowest common denominator because so some of us need to be better uh, that, that, than we are. This is an example of, uh, you know, on ongoing anaphylaxis management in from safer care. It says requ request further help from critical care, but that's, that's you. That's, but you're the critical care specialist. So they're calling you for help and you know what to do because you're the expert specialist. This is weird. It says cardiac or respiratory arrest commence CPR, but we shouldn't commence CPR on a respiratory arrest. We should just intubate them. So the, so the next section is about grouping asthma and anaphylaxis together in, in an arrest algorithm. So we, we can put them in the same basket. If an anaphylaxis patient presents unconscious or an extremist from food allergy, there's a 90 something percent chance that that arrest has happened from bronchospasm, according to epidemiology of anaphylaxis deaths. You could safely apply that to any anaphylaxis in any setting. In theatre, the airway and breathing is often controlled, but in the perioperative setting, like that uh, Prince of Wales uh, case, uh, the bronchospasm happened in a fulminant way. Um, and and uh, we really could extrapolate uh, uh, treat asthma as anaphylaxis and anaphylaxis as asthma. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And when I talk about asthma, I'm not talking about the 99% of asthma that comes in and you give them some bronchodilators and they get better. I'm talking about the people who uh, turn up blue on the doorstep or uh, have thunderstorm asthma or just uh, some uh, essentially presenting an extremis. Both groups of patients can be managed with the same therapy, which is adrenaline and cardiorespiratory support. You can tailor things as they evolve. Some asthma is actually anaphylaxis. There's, there's a study published in the US uh, in ICU, ventilated ICU patients that had asthma. 4% of them were actually anaphylaxis patients. So if you see an anaf asthma in extremis that you yeah, haven't got the history from and they've turned up on your doorstep, it could be anaphylaxis. But you need a clear mental model about what to do before it unfolds. So you can start your time critical response um, at a brainstem level. All right, and this is, uh, so Max, uh, Max has been providing the photography for, for this presentation. That's, uh, that's his dog, Millie. Um, now, I've just, just to demonstrate that anaphylaxis and asthma can be uh, treated in the same way, I've got the Ambulance Victoria guidelines, which are freely publicly available. They show that in AV anaphylaxis, in their clinical practice guideline, there's uh, bolus adrenaline IV and consider intubation. And then if we go down to asthma, down the bottom it says adrenaline IV, uh, you know, at two, you know, two minutely. So it's the same, it's the same treatment, asthma and anaphylaxis. The, the other thing uh, that's important when trying to develop or think about arrest algorithms, um, and asthma and anaphylaxis is actually recognising what respiratory arrest looks like. Uh, and talking to some of my PICU colleagues, uh, this, this is the best definition. Unconscious requiring bag valve mask support in the setting of asthma and anaphylaxis. So if they have that condition and you're actually having to help breathe for them, but they've had a respiratory arrest and you should call it as such. You can use the, the the poo of AVPU, like the pain or the unresponsive, that, that it might be an appropriate threshold. But it's important to know that respiratory arrest, um, it, it's often accompanied by hypoxic seizures. There might be some, you know, residual respiratory ineffective effort. It might be that they uh, have some residual motor response. All of those things are common, but they've had a respiratory arrest. They're, they're now not breathing effectively and they've become unconscious. And respiratory arrest uh, it will progress to cardiac arrest through bradycardia. So they, they then become bradycardic and then they become asystolic and that's it. All right, but that's what respiratory uh, arrest looks like. You, you need to be able to recognise it and not be distracted by any of those things and, and call it for what it is. Uh, I'm just this slide will skip, but I'm just trying to explain that there's nothing new here. All, all of this is just trying to put everything we already know about asthma and anaphylaxis into a structure that, that would be helpful for us in, in an emergency. Mm -hmm.